Friends, today we are in the Gospel of John. We're going to be at the very end of John's Gospel, chapter 21. If you want to turn there, the words will also be on the screen here in a minute. But if you would like to grab your Bible at home, I know that I love to have my own so I can make notes in it and follow along in the translation I prefer. So we're going to be in the Gospel of John today as we close out our sermon series. For the last month, we've been asking ourselves this question of how do we find God, not just on the holidays, not just on these big high moments of great joy like Christmas Eve and Easter. How do we find God in the mundane? How do we move out of a season of holidays into making holy days, into making every day holy? How do we find that? Remember the waters of our baptism. Remember the calling that God has placed on our life. And today we're going to finish that up by talking about how God sustains us through our walk, how God helps to reconcile our past so we can move forward how the Holy Spirit is present with us each and every day. We call that grace in our faith. How do we find that grace? Not just this provenient grace that comes after us before we even know it's real, but how do we experience the justification of God? How do we have the Spirit sanctify us as we walk throughout each day? How do we find God day after day. So we're going to wrap that up today by talking specifically about the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you that every day we have posted to our Facebook page at 6 a.m., and all of that is collected on our website and our sermons page, our GPS, our Guide for Prayer and Study. It's a daily devotion of scriptures and prayers that all relate back to the theme we talked about on Sunday, so we can continue to listen for God's voice as we go throughout our day. I'd encourage you to take advantage of that with you and your family. All right, friends, we are in the Gospel of John today. We are looking at the end of the story of Peter and Jesus as we find it in Jesus' time on earth. This is after Christ has been resurrected, and he comes and he meets the disciples while they are out fishing. And after they are out fishing, they come to the shore and they experience the risen Christ. And this is a conversation between Jesus and Peter. This is starting in verse 15, John 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy and righteous God, we come to you today to conclude this conversation, to conclude this series where we've been trying to find you every day. We've been trying to pray the Wesley Covenant prayer. We've been asking ourselves, how do we find you each day? Not just when it's easy, not just when we're well rested, not just when we have free time, not just on a holiday when there's beautiful lights, when it's Easter Sunday, but on the hard days, on the busy days, on the days where it's hard to find hope. How do we find you, oh God? How do we find you in the 11th month of a pandemic? God, these are the questions we've been asking, and today we ask you to open the story of Peter up to us today so that we might see what the Holy Spirit can do for us if we will let her into our life. God, you are King and Lord, and we ask that you bless us today and open our hearts that we may hear with joy this message that you've prepared for us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. This is the end of the story of Simon Peter. If you know anything about me, you know that I love Simon Peter. Pastor Courtney and I share that in common. We have a deep and abiding affection for Simon Peter. He is a real knucklehead. He is a leap before he looks or thinks. He is bold. He is brash. He is incredibly faithful. And he's also kind of a bonehead. I love Peter so much because he shows us what a faithful and a flawed disciple are like. I love this man so much because I see myself in him, in his mistakes, when he puts his foot in his mouth, and also the incredible ways that he says, you are God, and he follows. Peter is the rock on which Christ founded the church. That's what that word means, Petros. You are the rock on which I will found my church. It was a nickname that Christ gave to Simon. Last week, I talked a little bit about the call of Peter. When Jesus first called Peter to come and be fishers of people, he asked to borrow his boat. And after 
Peter allows him to borrow his boat. As a sign of gratitude, Jesus performs one of his early miracles, which is to tell Peter to cast his nets on the other side of the boat, and they catch more fish than they can even haul in. And Peter knows that it's God immediately, and he says, get away from me. I'm not a good person. Get away from me, God. And Peter says, I'm here for you. I'm going to change the world, and you're going to help me. Come and be fishers of people. That's how Jesus calls Peter. That's that miracle that we see. And we see here in this story, just before this conversation happens, Peter and the disciples have gone back to fishing because Jesus has been crucified. He's been executed by the state. And they think it's all over. All hope is lost. They, all, all the disciples fled and abandoned him. Peter denied him three times. They've all left. They think all is lost. And they go back to fishing because it's what they know. It's what's safe and easy. And this, in the Gospel of John, is the first time Peter sees Jesus after he's been raised from the dead. And he knows it's Christ because he's out fishing. And again, just like when he was first called, they've caught nothing all night long. They fished at night because, ironically, the fish can see the nets during the day. So they'd always fish at night. So it's early in the morning. And they're exhausted because they've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing. And they see this man on the shore and he calls out and he says, have you caught anything? He said, no. So we'll throw your nets on the other side of the boat. They're like, oh, whatever. And they do that, which is terrible advice, but they do it. And again, they can't haul the fish in because there's so much. Their nets are beginning to break. And Peter immediately is taken back to the moment that Christ called him. And he said, that's Jesus. That's God. And he throws himself into the water, right? Peter's nuts. I mean, he puts clothes on to jump in the water. No one does that. I mean, he's a, he's a wacko. He jumps in because he's got to go see Jesus. This is his best friend, his roommate. They live together. This is his best friend in the whole world. And he sprints over to him. And he finds Jesus there on the shore. And he says, come on, let's have breakfast. And he's cooking some fish on some fire. And he gathers around. And in this moment, Jesus has this conversation with him. Peter, do you love me? And feed my sheep. Many of us know this story. He asks him this question three times. And it's important that he asks him that question three times. And it's important what Jesus has done here. Jesus has not only recreated the moment he called him to ministry through this miracle, he's recreating the worst moment of Peter's life. Because in this text, it says that Jesus has gathered around, uh, has, has prepared a charcoal fire. Many of you have heard me talk about this before. There's fire all over scripture, but charcoal fire only happens twice. In this moment, and it's the kind of fire that Peter was standing by when he denied Christ. And he was asked three times, don't you know that guy? Don't you know Jesus? Don't you know him? He said, I don't know him. Three times he denied him, and then the rooster crowed. And so here on the shore, after he's been raised from the dead, Jesus is doing these two things. He's recreating these two moments, the call of Peter and his worst mistake of his life around the same kind of fire, asking him these questions three times, do you love me? And in that moment, you can feel it in the text that Peter gets it. It dawns on him what Jesus is doing. He sees the fire. And he's like, why is, he ask, why is he asking me this three times? Why is he calling me by my full name? Did you catch that? Simon, son of John. Right? I mean, it's like when your mother uses your full name, you know you're in trouble, right? He never called him Simon, son of John. It was always Simon or Peter, or Simon Peter. It was never Simon, son of John. He calls him by his full name and asks him this three times. And in that moment, you can feel the life drain out of Peter. Some of you know what that's like when you get caught in a lie or some mistake gets brought to light. Somebody asks you a question about something you've been hiding, something you're deeply ashamed of. And when they ask you about it, just your blood pressure rises and at the same time all the blood drains out of your head and your whole body starts to tense up and shake and just the life is drained out of you. In this moment, Jesus is doing these two things. He's reminding him of his call and he's reminding him of the worst mistake of his life. Now, why is he doing this? Is he just trying to be mean? Is he just trying to get revenge on Peter? What's happening here? Well, here I think Peter's doing, Jesus is doing two things for Peter. One, I think he's telling him, I still love you. The invitation is still open. You're still called. I still want you to be the rock on which I found my church. That's the recreation of his call story. He says, remember when I performed that miracle? Remember when I called you away from fishing to be fishers of people? Why are you fishing again? What are you doing, Peter? You knew I was going to die. I told you over and over again I was going to die, but not even death could separate us. That would not stop us. I told you this was just beginning. What are you doing out here? Come on, Peter. 
The invitation's still open. I still love you. I still want you to be the rock on which I found my church. That conversation is still open. God always leads with grace. God always leads with love. Peter, the door's still open. I still love you. Come have some breakfast. The second thing he does is he forces him to deal with his shame and this pain that he's carrying around. Jesus is forcing him to deal with this lowest moment of his life. And I think that if Jesus didn't do this, then Peter would never have recovered from it. I think if Jesus doesn't force Peter to deal with this, then, then Peter would have gone back to fishing, and every time that a rooster crowed, it would have been an instant reminder of the worst mistake of his life. Every time he heard that rooster crow in the morning, you failed him, Peter. That's what he'd hear in his head. Every morning when the rooster crows, you let him down. You denied him, Peter. Every time the rooster crowed, you betrayed him. You abandoned him in his hour of need, Peter. You did. You failed him, Peter. The Son of God gave you everything, and when he needed you the most, you denied even knowing him every time he heard a rooster crow. Some of you know what that's like to have something that reminds you of a terrible mistake, and when you see it, the life drains out of you. You can't seem to escape it because you're constantly reminded of this mistake you've made, this pain that you're carrying around. I think in this moment, Jesus is trying to save Peter's life. He's trying to say, come on, man, you're not defined by this. A lot of people think that Jesus is just trying to hurt Peter in this text. There are a lot of people who think that he's just trying to remind him of this pain to punish him for his betrayal. Because there are a lot of people who've only really experienced God in that way through guilt and shame and punishment. They're afraid of God. They think that if you are bad, God will do bad things to you to teach you a lesson. That's not what we believe about God. We believe that God always leads with grace. God always says, I love you. It's that provenient grace. That God provides a meal for the disciples there. That God always gives us what we need for the day. And then God will force us to deal with our baggage, so it doesn't control us, and it doesn't define us. Jesus isn't trying to hurt Peter. He's not trying to shame him or embarrass him. He's trying to heal him. He's trying to help him so he can move forward. Peter, do you love me? I know you do. I know you love me. We've got to move on from this, Peter. You can't run back to fishing. Peter, do you love me? I know you do. We have work to do. Peter, do you love me? I know you do. I know you do. So come on. There are people out there who are scared. There are people in the world who are living controlled by some shame or some mistake they've made in their life. There are people who have so much pain and trauma that they can't move forward. And it dominates and controls their life just like it has for you, Peter. So feed my sheep. Take care of them. Let them know that they are not defined or controlled by this shame, by this trauma, by this pain that they have in their life. That's not what defines them, Peter. Feed my sheep. I think Jesus is trying to heal him, trying to save his life in this moment. And I think Jesus does the same thing for us. I think Jesus sets us free from that. The problem is we don't have the living Jesus, even the resurrected walking Jesus, to do that for us. But that's why we celebrate the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Jesus told the disciples that. He knew it would be hard when he left. And so he said, I will, send, I will ask the Father to send another, an advocate to be with you. And that's the Holy Spirit. We celebrate that at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes into our life and does this same thing for us. Reconciles us. Makes us new continues each and every day to walk with us, forcing us to deal with our pain and our guilt. God isn't trying to hurt us by pointing out these mistakes and this pain in our life. God is trying to heal us. So I want you to think about what is the trauma and the pain that you're holding on to? What is the heartache that exists in your life? What shame, what mistake? What is the thing in your life that you are so ashamed of? that you dare not tell anyone. That deep, dark secret you're holding on to that you pray no one ever finds out about. That if somebody mentioned it out loud, you would run away and you would never see those people again. Christ is gonna make you deal with it or it will haunt you forever and you'll never be able to live into your calling. 
Maybe it's not a mistake you've made. Maybe it's something hurtful, some sort of pain, a lie. What lie did someone tell you that you've started to believe? Is there a time in your life when someone said that you weren't good enough? You weren't worthy? You weren't lovable? You're stupid? You're ugly? You're not good enough in some way? And over time, you've started to believe that. You've started to let that pain and that lie and those traumas define who you are and keep you from living into your calling. Christ is going to make you deal with it. Christ is going to help you confront that so it doesn't control you. This whole month, we've been talking about the Wesley Covenant prayer, this prayer that John Wesley gave us. And I love this prayer because it reminds us that we are defined by God, not our past mistakes. We're not defined by this trauma and this pain that exists in our past. But we have to confront it. We have to confront that past. We have to confront that pain or it will haunt us. It will control us. It will live with us forever. We'll end up doing what Peter did. We'll go back to fishing. We'll go back to doing what's comfortable. We'll come to church when it's convenient. Or we'll just kind of stop altogether. We'll focus on having the most successful and the most comfortable life for ourselves and our family, and we'll forget about our neighbors. We'll forget to do justice in the world. We'll forget that God called us to so much more. God calls us to so much more, and we see this in this text. Peter is broken down by this. He's so ashamed. He's so hurt that he can't move forward. And Jesus comes to him, and he says, Peter, do you love me? I know you do. You don't have to let this pain and this mistake and this shame define you anymore. You don't have to let it control you, Peter. I took that denial and I buried it in the ground on Friday. That sin is dead. That's the whole point of all of this. You are a new creation, Peter. The old is gone. So rise with me. Get up, Peter. Get off the boat. We've got work to do because there is a whole world of people who don't know this. And they're living with this shame every day. And they don't know how to move past it. They don't know that there's hope. They don't know that God still loves them. And I know that there are some of you who feel that way too. There's a shame, there's a mistake, there's a pain, there's a heartache that you can't escape. And it keeps you from being that beautiful creation that God has created you to be. It's time to put that in the ground. It's time to move past that. And friends, it's not easy. I'm not here to say, just pray and it's gone. That's not how it works. We know that. Grief is a long process. Shame is a long process. It takes a long time for us to work through that with others, but we can't do it alone. That's why we have the Christian community. That's why we have the church. That's why we believe in the power of therapy and prayer and counseling, community through small group. That's why we believe in those things and support them. This isn't quick or easy, but I can tell you that if Peter can come back from denying Christ three times in his hour of need to becoming the rock on which Christ built the church, you can come back from whatever mistake you've made. You can overcome whatever pain and trauma you have in your life. Whatever exists in your past that's weighing you down today, that you're scared will come out, that you think about, that keeps you from being who God has called you to be. It's time to let God into that. You're going to have to deal with it, and it's going to hurt. But if you'll let God be a part of that, you can begin to heal, and you can begin to move forward. And I think that's how we work to make every day holy. We have to deal with what dominates our past. We have to deal with the shame and the secrets we hold in, or every day they'll define our choices, they'll define who we are, and they'll keep us from being who God calls us to be. Friends, God will change the world through you if you'll say yes. God will set you free from this pain and this shame that you may be carrying around. But you're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to let God into that dark moment. You're going to have to let somebody else into it. You're going to have to confide in someone and work through that with a loved one, with a therapist, with a counselor, with a pastor, with a close friend or family member. Don't try to willpower your way through it. You'll lose every time. Trauma and grief and shame are way too powerful for us to will our way through it. I've tried. It doesn't work, but you don't have to do it alone. That's the good news. Christ knew that from the very beginning. The first thing he does in ministry is surround himself with a group of people to love him, hold him accountable, and accomplish this work together. We're not meant to be alone. 
And the more we isolate ourselves, the more that shame and that pain and that depression and that sense of hopelessness can creep in until it consumes you. And like Peter, you just go back to what's easy. You just give up. And you just go back to fishing. Friends, you're called to so much more than that. And the Holy Spirit helps us to live into our calling every day to remind us that we are defined by God and not by our past. So may you live into that freedom today. Let us pray. Holy God, we all carry around baggage. We all have heartache and sorrow. We all have shame. And yet you remind us that we are not defined by that. We are not defined by our past. We're not defined by the mistakes we've made. But God, it's hard to move past it. It's hard when we're reminded of those things so frequently. It's hard when we feel trapped because no one knows what we're going through. We dare not tell anyone. God, remind us of this story of Peter every day. That you come first offering grace. That you set the table and provide a meal for us. But then you will always put your finger on our pain and our shame. Not to hurt us, but to heal us to make us confront and deal with these things that have great power over us, but do not have power over you. God, remind us that through Christ, all things are possible. Be with us and set us free from these things that weigh us down in our past so we can live into the calling that you've placed on our lives. God, we need your help because this is hard work, but we believe through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's possible. So rise us as you have risen from the grave, O Lord and let us be defined by you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.